Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Marungi. It is indeed a joy and a privilege to be here with you, and especially to open God's Word together. I invite you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Joshua is in the Old Testament, the sixth book of the Bible, right after Deuteronomy. Back home in Alabama, I have been preaching through the book of Joshua, and I'd like to share with you a little bit that the Lord has taught me through this book. The book of Joshua begins as the people of God are about to enter into the promised land. They have been brought out of slavery in Egypt in a miraculous way. They have walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. They followed the leadership of Moses for 40 years, wandering in the desert, and they are now on the cusp of entering into the land that their God had promised to them so long ago. And in chapter 1, we see God clearly passing the mantle of leadership from Moses to Joshua. Joshua is the one tasked with leading God's people into the promised land that he is giving to them. And multiple times in chapter 1, the people and Joshua are exhorted to be strong, be courageous, because God will be with you. Indeed, courage is a strong theme throughout the whole book of Joshua. Be bold. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. God is with you wherever you will go. And it's on the heels of this exhortation for Joshua and his people to be full of courage that we find ourselves in chapter 2 this morning. And we'll see again, this is a continuation of this story of courage, but it's not the story that we would expect. Now, the narrative takes a surprising turn. It involves spies and intrigue and deception and a bold confession of faith, a promise of safety, dare I say, a promise of salvation from the impending judgment to come. But let's look at our text in Joshua chapter 2 and read it together. Hear the word of our Lord this morning. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came to the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them, she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and had hidden them with stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. And before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord, as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. And give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If we do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. She let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. 
The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then if, every, if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his own blood shall be on his head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is in this house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to the oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your word, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. And they came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Sends the reading of God's perfect and holy word. Let's pray one more time. Our Holy Father in heaven, we pray that you would speak to us, speak through your word, shape us, mold and fashion us as we come to receive the food of your holy word. Teach us more of yourself. Pray. In Christ's name, amen. We will frame our study this morning in terms of two major points. These are two surprises, we might say. First, we'll see the surprising mercy of the Lord, and then we'll see surprising faith. Surprising mercy and then surprising faith. Let's begin by looking at the surprising mercy of the Lord. By my count, there are at least three instances of the mercy of the Lord in this chapter. A first instance that we see is that the Lord uses Rahab's actions to bring about great good. Mercifully, he chooses to use her work of lies to bring about the good of preserving the lives of the spies. The story begins with Joshua sending the spies into the land to scout out the city of Jericho. They go to the house of a prostitute there named Rahab. The text doesn't say explicitly why they went there, presumably because that would be a place where foreigners would not be uncommon where people don't ask too many questions, and so it would be a good place to lay low, to fly under the radar. And somehow, word reaches the king that there are some Israelite spies lurking around, and so the king sent to Rahab, says, bring out those men. Now the reader here, as we're going through the story, is starting to get a little tense, get nervous. We'd expect this Canaanite prostitute to now hand over the men. She would want to do well for herself, and pleasing the king in this way would go well for her. But she doesn't do that. And not only does she not do that, she hides the men and then lies about the situation. She says, those guys were here. I, I didn't know where they came from, but they've already gone. If you go quickly, you'll catch up to them. Now, some people get really twisted up into knots as they read this portion of Scripture because we have a woman praised twice in the New Testament for her faith, which we'll get to in a minute. She's praised for her courageous faith in helping the spies, but she lies. Isn't lying wrong? How can she be commended as a model of faithfulness two times in the New Testament while also lying? Well, a couple of brief observations. First, we should note that this passage makes neither an endorsement nor a condemnation of her lying. It simply recounts it. The point of this passage is not centered upon her deception per se. I'll argue in a minute that the chapter focuses on her confession of faith, which we will soon see. But second, we must also remember that when we read Scripture, when we seek to interpret it and apply it, we should interpret the less clear portions of Scripture in light of those passages which are more clear. That's fundamental to good reading of the Bible. We read the harder-to-understand passages in light of the 
easier to understand passages. And there are many passages in Scripture that make perfectly clear that lying and deception and falsehood are are not consistent with holiness. For example, Ephesians chapter 4 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak with truth to his neighbor. Put away all corrupting talk from your mouth. Indeed, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, it specifically mentions liars as being destined for the lake of fire. Being a liar, I would argue, makes us more like Satan because we have Jesus' own words. He says that Satan is the father of lies, John 8, 44. We're not called to imitate Satan. We're rather called to imitate God and What did Jesus say of himself? I am the way and the truth, John 14, 6. So lying ought to be avoided because it's inconsistent with the very nature of our Savior. And it makes us more like the father of lies than our heavenly father. So back to our story. If lying is wrong and yet her faith is commended in two different passages in the New Testament, how do we put these two things together? Well, I think we can put them together by remembering the mercy of the Lord. God was kind to use the feeble, though well-intended works of Rahab to save the spies. Two things can be true. She can be exercising commendable faith while also doing it imperfectly and not choosing perhaps the best way to do it. Even though she was trying to do a good thing and a noble thing, she chose to do it in a sinful way of speaking lies. And yet in the mercy of God, her faith in this passage can still be commendable. Because we know that even when our good works are mixed, they're not perfectly pure, which is always the case in this age. God's mercy can still shine through those imperfect actions. And this ought to be an encouragement to us. For here, God can and does use imperfect deeds to bring about good and mercy in this age. Even when our deeds are tainted with sin, God's mercy is still stronger. He delights in showing His grace, even through the frail and impure actions of His children. And this point will be made even more clear when we look at the second way in which we see God's surprising mercy in this chapter. We see that with the very presence of Rahab herself. The very fact that you and I know Rahab's name at all is a mercy. And let me explain what I mean. If you step back in the book of Joshua and you look, it would seem that the story would more naturally flow from chapter 1 straight into chapter 3. There's no need from a human perspective for there to be a chapter 2 at all. Chapter 1, God promises that the people will take the land, He will be with them, and He will give the land to them. Chapter 3, they begin to move into the land, and almost immediately they begin to take the land. No need for chapter 2 at all. There's no reason, humanly speaking, for spies to be sent into the land. Chapter 1, He already told them He was going to give them the land. Why do they need spies at all? I would argue that the sending of the spies was not so much that the people might have success in battle. That was already secure. God had already promised He would give them success. No, in God's plan, the spies were sent into the land because He had a child that needed saving. One of His elect, Rahab, needed to be saved. And if it weren't for the spies going into the land, she would have been killed just like the rest of the Canaanites in Jericho. So the very fact that Rahab had the chance to run into those spies and demonstrate her faith is evidence of the mercy of God shown to her in this chapter. This chapter is about the conversion of a pagan, a Canaanite, indeed, a Canaanite prostitute. And it should remind us that in Scripture, God's mercy often extends to unexpected places. Think about the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. There are many similarities between Rahab and that Samaritan woman from her ethnicity difference, from her moral choices in life. Or think about the woman in Luke chapter 7 who anoints Jesus' feet and then 
whites them with her own hair. You remember the Pharisee in that scene, what he's thinking to himself as he watches this this harlot of a woman wipe Jesus' feet? He said to himself, if Jesus knew what kind of sinner she really was, he wouldn't even let her touch his feet. But that's exactly the point that Jesus came to proclaim. He said that it's not the healthy that need healing, it's the sick. It's not the righteous who need mercy, it's the sinful, it's the wicked, it's the harlots, it's the pagans, it's the people like me, the people like you. Rahab's story is a beautiful reminder of that, that nobody is too sinful, nobody's too far gone to be without hope, nobody is too dirty, too defiled to be beyond the reach of a merciful God. So maybe you're here this morning and you feel a bit like Rahab. You know that you're separated from God and you're aware that you've lived a life of sin. Take heart. She was praised as a model of faith and her God can be your God if you believe like she did. But before we get to her faith, I want to mention one last instance of mercy in this text and it's found at the very end. You probably read right over it without noticing it, but notice God's mercy in encouraging his people. His mercy in encouraging his people. At the end of the chapter, the spies eventually get back to Joshua and they report saying, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. In a real sense, the spies come back with no new information. God had already told the people that he would give them the land and that the people would melt away. In fact, Moses in Exodus 15, 15, explicitly predicted that Canaan would melt away. So why go through this trouble of sending the spies and putting them in danger? Wasn't God's prior promise of success in victory enough? Well, of course it was enough. It was sufficient. His promises were certainly enough. And yet, God is so kind to his people He knows their frame. He knows our frame. He knows that we are weak. We're often fearful. We are tempted to doubt his promises. We are tempted to forget what he has already given to us. And so in his mercy, doesn't he often send reminders of the promises that he has already given to us to strengthen us when we are weak in our faith? Have you ever experienced that in your life? Your moment... You're in a moment of weakness, and then something comes along, and a merciful gift of the Lord, and it strengthens your faith when you need it the most. Maybe it was a timely word from a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe it was a passage of Scripture that God brings to your mind when you needed it in a moment of weakness and temptation. Maybe it was a kind action from some place that you would have never expected. Or maybe. It's the week by week drops of mercy that God uses to sustain you and me as we walk together towards our heavenly promised land. I'm talking about the weekly gathering of believers, the preaching and teaching from Scripture, the prayers, the fellowship, the singing, the ordinances like baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are like manna from heaven, and each of these are bits of mercy, vessels of his grace, sent by God and evidences of his love towards you, believer. And just like he encouraged the hearts of the Israelites before they went into battle, by reminding him of what he had already promised to give them, so too does God every week remind me and you of his promises and of the inheritance that waits for us ahead. So do not overlook the mercy of the Lord and don't neglect the sweet encouragement that can be found when we reflect upon the promises and on what he's done to ensure our final victory and our eventual entrance into our heavenly promised land that he's prepared for us. Now let's move on to our second main point, and that is to see Rahab's surprising faith. Rahab's surprising faith. We can look again. At what she says to the spies, starting in verse 9. I want to break down her words, because in them we will notice something of the essence of true faith. 
Verse 9, she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you came out of, uh, before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and to Og, whom you devoted to destruction. Now, as we look through what she says, we can see in her faith a summary of her profession of faith. And there are three words which we can use to remember. And they each start with the letter M. We see first in verse 10, she confesses the might of the Lord. The might of the Lord. He dried up the water of the Red Sea, pointing us back to the Exodus event. He devoted to destruction the Amorite kings, Sihon and Og. You can read about that in Numbers chapter 21. That's, that's your homework. She had apparently heard of the mighty works of the Lord. We don't know how she had heard, but she had heard nonetheless. But her confession doesn't stop there. She moves on from recounting the might of the Lord to describing the majesty of the Lord. The majesty of the Lord, verse 11. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heavens above and on the earth beneath. This is the confession, consistent with genuine faith. God is in heaven and Lord of it, and I am not. It's the same proclamation that the Israelites were supposed to uphold Deuteronomy 4.39. And yet here we have a pagan professing it. Unlike her Canaanite upbringing, which taught that there were various gods, that each nation might have its own specific local god, she instead confesses here there's only one true God, and he's utterly supreme over both heaven and all the earth. His majesty is not shared with another. But if you'll notice closely, what we have so far is not quite yet the fullness of biblical faith. She affirms the might of God demonstrated in his works of judgment and redemption. She affirms the majesty of God that he's supreme over all. But assenting to those truths is not the same yet as true saving faith. Indeed, as James reminds us in the New Testament, we might say that even the demons know that God is mighty and that he is majestic. No, we have to keep reading to see the third component of her confession, and that is her belief in the mercy of the Lord. Her belief in the mercy of the Lord. Go Back to verse 12. She says, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord, as I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. Here we see an image of the heart of true biblical faith. Genuine faith is never content merely to confess that there is a God. Genuine faith is not even enough to say that the God of the Bible is the true God. Even the demons say that. No, genuine faith presses on to take refuge in God. As one commentator put it, true faith never stops with brooding over the nature or the activity with God, but runs to take refuge under His wings. Her faith was more than a mere assent to the might or the presence of God, she pressed further, seeing within his character no mere terrible dictator, but a good and merciful Lord. That's why the author of Hebrews goes on to commend her faith by saying, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies, Hebrews 11.31. Her faith was genuine, which we know because it produced within her great works of faith. James 2.25 tells us clearly that Rahab was justified or her, her faith was vindicated. It was demonstrated 
because she helped protect the people of God. She was no mere speaker of the truth. She was a doer, to use James's words. We might say she put her money where her mouth was. Now consider how much she had to lose in this episode. She was risking her own life to protect the spies, to deceive the king's messengers. If she were to be caught, she would have been done for. She would have been killed for treasonous activity against the king. But she was also repudiating her own country, her heritage, her people, the Canaanites. By putting her faith in God and trusting in him, she was letting go of everything that mattered to her, her lineage, her upbringing. And yet she knew that duty to God was a greater calling than anything in this world. And so her genuine faith demonstrated itself through helping the people of God. True faith is always built on a confession of who God is and what he's done, but it necessarily overflows into good works. Faith produces good works. And so how about you this morning? Are you able to look at your life and see good works in keeping with your confession of faith? Do you help the people of God like Rahab did? Now, we're not called to put on our swords and to enter into physical warfare for a plot of land in the Middle East. But each of us is called into a battle, a spiritual battle. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, as Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6. And so do you battle alongside and, and for the people of God? Do you pray for your brothers and sisters? How often do we help each other in the church? Do we take them in, showing hospitality and mercy, lifting them up when they are in need, supporting them when they cannot support themselves? Are you like Rahab, willing to suffer in order to demonstrate the genuineness of your faith and your allegiance to God? See, too often we like to stick to what is, what is comfortable, what is familiar, what feels safe. It's not, not too costly for me. I'm willing to sacrifice. I can apply it in a different way. Recall with me that Rahab's faith was built upon what she had heard. What she had heard about the mighty works of God in the Exodus and defeating the pagan king, she believed because she had first heard, which is what we would expect because we all have read Romans 10, which says faith comes by hearing. That makes sense. And so I ask you, how often do you speak of the mighty works of God? How often do you talk about the greatest act of mercy, which is Jesus Christ dying on the cross to save sinners? You certainly have Rahabs in your life who may hear and believe, but in order for them to believe, they must first hear. So let us be generous in speaking of the works of God, remembering like Rahab that our God is Merciful, but in order for them to embrace mercy, they must first hear about this merciful God. Indeed, recall with me back in Exodus. You remember when God is revealing himself to Moses, he describes himself in Exodus 34. How does God describe himself? Does he say, the Lord, the Lord, righteous and just? It's not what he says. That would have been true. But it's not what he says. No, the self-revelation of God revealing his character and his person to Moses is the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. That's how God describes himself. The first adjective that he leads with is merciful. And so we should spread the good news of the mighty works of our majestic and merciful God. Because we know that no sinner is too far gone. There's nobody that you know that's too pagan. There's nobody that's too wicked, too dirty that the Lord cannot redeem them. And the whole time, 
that we're speaking, that we're interacting with the Rahabs in our life, we remember that message of mercy applies to us as well. Each of us is just like Rahab. We were born not into the people of God. We were not born in the household of faith. We were born, as it were, into a pagan nation like Rahab, a nation of sinners, a nation condemned to death. We were all in Adam. He was our father, and our heritage was sin and death. But God, being rich in mercy, delighted to send his son to die in the place of sinners, in the place of the sons of Adam. And all that is required for life in him is to believe. Believe the messages like Rahab believed what she had heard. Believe that Christ has come, that he has taken the punishment of wicked sinners, the punishment that people like me and you deserved, and he bore it on the cross, dying for sin and atoning in our place, and simple faith in him. A fleeing to him for mercy, like Rahab trusting in the Lord for mercy. That's all that it takes for us to escape the coming judgment. But the coming judgment of this world is not coming at the edge of a a Hebrew sword. No, the final judgment will come not when the walls of a city fall like Jericho's do in chapter 6. No, the judgment will come when Jesus returns. And he will separate the sheep and the goats, the Believers and the unbelievers and those possessing faith like Rahab will be ushered into eternal paradise, into the heavenly promised land. But those who continue to reject God will receive a worse sentence than any person at Jericho received. The hard-hearted will enter into eternal judgment in hell. And So don't let that be your case. Trust in Christ today, and you too can be saved from the wrath to come. Simple faith. Faith in the promises of God. That those united to Christ by faith will be spared from eternal death. That is the offer that is extended to you today. Indeed, that promise. That promise of eternal life. Life through Christ. Christ dying in our place is also pictured in our text in another way actually seen in a second way in the Lord's table, which will be celebrated later today. You remember our text leaves us with Rahab sending out the spies, lowering them down by a rope from the window. And she ties a scarlet cord into the window so that when the army comes, they will know which house is to be saved. And I won't elaborate on all the connections, but this this scarlet rope points us backwards, the Passover event. Remember right before the Exodus, the angel of the Lord went over every house in the nation of Egypt, killing the firstborn of each household, but showing mercy to the households that had blood over their doorposts. Blood and judgment and mercy are inextricably linked together in Scripture. And the blood-colored cord highlighted Rahab's house becomes the the means of her escape from judgment, that her house might be passed over when the army of judgment comes to Jericho. And so too, you will recall also that the New Testament picks up this theme of the Passover and explicitly calls Christ our Passover lamb. His blood is the means of our escaping judgment. His blood is what averts the wrath of God. His blood is that which is the propitiation for our sins, which means His blood absorbs every drop of righteous wrath that God has aimed at you. So instead of wrath, believers now receive blessing. Instead of death, we now receive life. That's pictured for us in our text in the scarlet cord and indeed in the table, which we will celebrate later today, where the body and blood of Christ pictured in the elements is separated. Like manna in the wilderness, like a good report from the spies, God encourages the hearts of his people by a reminder of his provision, of the blood that has been shed for us, that Christ has been slain, the Lamb's blood has been spilt so that you might be spared. Remember those promises. Hear the good report. 
Let your hearts be encouraged by the promises of God. And let us remember the sacrificial work of Christ in our place. Let's pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for the gift of a substitute, of a sacrifice whose blood was shed so that we can be cleansed. Lord, that cleansing is pictured in the baptism that we just saw moments ago. It's pictured in our text. And Rahab and her family being saved from the coming judgment. And Lord, it will be pictured in the Lord's table, which is ahead of us today. Lord, we ask that you would bless the preaching of your word. And may the promises be planted deep within our hearts. And may we receive your implanted word with meekness. Because we know that it is indeed able to save our souls. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.